we're going to start out today with hearing about from all of the panelists about how they got started in IT and technology, and um, and then we're going to go to do a little. I'll do a little Q and A with everybody, and uh, I think then we can open it up for questions too. Cool. All right. So I'm going to start at the end with Aaron. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Take it away, Aaron. <laughs> Putting me on the spot. Uh, hi, everybody. I've chatted with a lot of you. I'm Erin Merchant. So if you haven't met me in person, but we've soapboxed about something in the Slack channel, I'd love to chat with you or at least meet you for realsies. Um, I probably have a very like typical origin story in tech, uh, especially with Mac admin is like, I didn't expect to do this first off. <laughs> Um, I went to school for international relations and global public health. Uh, totally makes sense. <laughs> makes a ton of sense. Thanks for the woo. Uh, yeah. Um, but in, in one sense or the other, I started at Apple. I've always, like, I was the first kid on my block who had a computer. Um, I was immediately told by my parents that I should not touch it while they were out of the house. So, of course, I immediately did exactly the opposite. Um, I also managed to sign myself up for an AOL account at the age of, like, I think 11 by doing that, which they were extremely pleased with. Um, so the fascination was always there, I suppose. Um, you know, like we came into, I came into technology at such like an interesting advent of the time. So being on that like cusp of understanding like more analog devices that are no longer perpetually in use, um, which I think gives a lot of the folks, a lot of us on this panel, a really interesting perspective on tech. Um, so I dot, like, kind of like doggedly made my way in and out of it over the years, and then I uh, got a gig accidentally through some of previous Apple connections at Pixar, um, where I spent the last 10 years of my life developing most of my technological skills. So uh, along with like the emotional roller coaster that is making like a huge career change, um, I was self-taught and then peer-taught. Um, and then decided that I had to figure out what I was going to continue to do within the realm of like the Mac admin sphere, within the realm of systems administration and IT, because I didn't ever really have a true desire to go like full comp sci or into an engineering role. <gasps> um, so, <laughs> oh God. Um, so I ended up leaning more on the community and poking at what people were looking for. Um, in that they were lacking or that they wanted to talk to somebody about that wasn't necessarily being addressed within our community. Um, a lot of that, as many people know, is like job development, career growth, um, leadership skills and development, how to speak appropriately on panels or how to speak on a panel at all. You too can do this. Mm -hmm. I will gladly trade you any day. <laughs> um, and, and what I found is that there's a lack of understanding around what operational IT and operational, like we call it workplace technology. I've since moved on to Envoy. I probably should have added that in. Plug my really rad company. Also, I have really cool stickers. <laughs> I didn't know that stickers were like a hot commodity, but I brought some really cool internal ones um, that, yeah. Um, so hit me up for some stickers because they've been in my wallet for like two weeks. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so operational IT kind of became my focus because I found that there was a really amazing partnership that I could provide um, as somebody who has a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of passion for the work that we do, but doesn't necessarily want to be the one who's actually like mashing keyboard. It's, it's just not for me, but I like seeing other people thrive in their position and their capability and have, like making them shine in what they can do. So here I am to support all of you. <laughs> <laughs> the End by Aaron Merchant. <laughs> okay, we'll go down the line, Teresa. You ready? Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Teresa, uh, though on the Mac admin Slack, my name is Riza says hi. Hello. Um, <laughs> I, uh, similar to Aaron, didn't realize that this is what I was going to be doing. Uh, I entered college studying chemical engineering um, because I was like, yeah, chemistry. And then I realized that primarily everyone in chemical engineering went into the big oil industry. And I was like, ooh, morals. Um, <laughs> uh, luckily for go. me, <laughs> during my junior year of college, I was like looking for a part-time job, want to make some dough. 
I went to a career site that was internal for my school, and I did a sort by salary. Um, and at the <laughs> and from from price to, uh, from high to low. And at the very top was actually some jobs from our student affairs uh, residential computing. Um, Org, which is kind of partially student team and then partial career staff. And it runs a lot of the computing systems at my school, which included uh, printing and all of the computer centers and all of those things. Uh, so I was like, great, looks like it's a fit for me. I have no experience in this. Uh, might as well go interview. Uh, <laughs> so I actually went in to the interview, didn't study at all, bad choice. Uh, and they gave me a written test as part of it, and I knew no nothing there. And then the other half was kind of an in-person uh, chat with the student lead at the time. Uh, the student lead, uh, he has now become basically one of the pivotal moments in my life, uh, was actually kind of on a mission himself to diversify the Windows System Administrator team, uh, which at that point in time was four, uh, four students who were all male, as well as uh, three career staff who were all male. Um, and he was, he thought that that was, you know, problematic. So even though I didn't do too great in that interview, they did specify that the job didn't need any experience and they would train on the job. So luckily he kind of looked at me and saw potential and actually took a chance on me. And I think for me that has always been such a big moment in my life because it was only from that accidental part-time job where I wanted to make some cash, where I got kind of my first experience in IT. Uh, I learned about servers. I learned about Active Directory. Uh, I was on call for two weeks straight where it was like 3 a.m. I had to run into a server room. Um, and it was it was really valuable experience that I got as a student at the time. Uh, and they trained me for free with only, the only expectation of trying to do my best and learning as much as I could. Um, and then after that, it was with that experience that I was able to land my first job in IT. Uh, at that point in time, I had realized chemical engineering was really not for me. Uh, graduated with the degree, but really didn't want to go into uh, the oil industry. So I kind of fell into IT because I had the experience and, you know, years later, here I am. Uh, I really enjoy empowering the company that I work for, but also specific users to be more effective with their technology. And I think that's the general kind of um, executive statement of my day to day. And that's really ranged in different roles that I've had, uh, whether it is kind of you know, doing sysadmin work or now it's kind of doing more IT management work. Uh, I work on a team of about 40 IT individuals now, so it's been pretty fun. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Can you guys hear me? I feel like I'm going to be doing this because I'm paranoid that you can't. Um, hi, I'm Shauna. Um, I guess I'll get kind of started with how I, how I ended up in IT. Um, like the other two people next to me, I didn't know, um, didn't have any idea um, about getting into IT. I was fresh out of college, kind of wet behind the ears, like, I need a job. I need to pay these student loans. Um, so I applied for a position at a nonprofit in Baltimore. Um, it was an office manager position. They didn't really have a whole lot of like information about what it entailed. Um, and then I got there and I just kind of figured out like what they needed, what was missing, and I kind of just fit into those parts and those pieces. Um, they had a part-time system administrator that wasn't around as much. He was there about two hours a week, um, which is not enough time to run around and solve everybody's problems. Um, so I kind of created an ad hoc um, help desk, so to speak, and that's where I got started in IT. There were about 35 Macs on the floor, um, and I just pretty much walked around and checked in with everybody, um, made really detailed spreadsheets, like did the whole nine, you know, spreadsheets, yay. Um, and that's, that's kind of how I got started. Um, after I ran myself into the ground, <laughs> trying to do that manually, um, we decided to implement Jamf um, in the environment. Um, and that's where I got started kind of um, doing a different kind of system administration. Um, and I got um, a couple certs and um, realized um, I got, you know, help desk is really tough. It's a really tough job. I mean, I, I think we can all agree that it's a kind of thankless work at, at certain points. <laughs> um, and I got to a point where I was like, oh, this is really like hard. Like, I was a little burnt out, and I was like, you know, maybe I should, um, maybe I should like take a break. You know, I took a break, stepped back, 
leaned on the community a lot. Um, I think the people on the panel, as well as other people, um, allies and stuff, really gave me a lot of support. Um, and I kind of realized that, like, I belong here. I want to keep doing this stuff. Um, and yeah, uh, that's kind of where I am. And that's, yeah, it's really short, but it's all I got. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lauren Johnson. Uh, I work for Keep Trucking. Um, I got into IT completely by accident. Uh, completely by accident. Hi, I'm a history major, and I'm a little confused as to why I'm standing here right now. At least 20-year-old me would be very confused right now. Um, but my like love of tech has always been there. I just never really realized it. It wasn't that I never thought I could. It was There's was never a situation where, like, oh, that's a male-dominated field. I can't go into it. Or, no, it's too much for me. I just didn't even know IT or technology was an avenue for me. I, I went to school, and my school didn't have a lot of computer-based classes. And my parents didn't have, not until like it became more common, a computer at home. So it really just wasn't a thing I knew about. But my obsession with ripping apart hardware was much earlier with my desperate need to fix my Super Nintendo. And <laughs> um, so I blame video games for getting me into tech. Um, and once I fixed that, that was very important. Um, it was very important. Um, we basically, I, I went to school and they finally, midway through high school, started a Unix class. And I was like, oh, well, I, I broke and fixed that. I could. That might be cool. Um, Auto Shop doesn't have that, uh, so let's figure that out too. So I went, and you know they started basic, basic Unix stuff, and I found it very interesting, but I didn't find it very entertaining. It was something that worked for me, but I was just kind of bored. Um, so I figured, oh, maybe this coding thing—that's like a thing that people seem to be into now, not my thing. Um, so I went to school and decided I, you know, couldn't really figure out what to do. Did history, and then my freshman year. Everyone on my floor had computer problems that somehow I was able to fix. <laughs> Usually malware, lots of malware. Um, <laughs> it was a lot. Um, so I just started basically charging people five bucks to clean up their machines. That was just a thing I did. I needed extra money, and I was like, somebody downloaded something from visiting certain websites, and uh, really, really, really needed to actually write that turn paper on that machine that was no longer working. Uh, so I would be like, all right, yeah, I can fix that for you. And it just, I went to the library and just got like books that I could find, and there weren't many, and they were really outdated. So I thought this was just some weird, archaic thing I was just making some side cash on. And then um, it just I got more and more interested. I had friends who were very much into technology, but they were all going into computer science, and they were all going to be programmers and things like that, and it just seemed too complicated. But once I was done with school, I went to just go get a job, any job, and I didn't even think of it. I ended up in call center customer support, which has a lot of uh, some similarities with the helping people and helping users and figuring that out. So I learned a lot about you know, how to get users to tell me what their problem was and like explain to me what they were experiencing on the phone without seeing, because uh, we didn't have a lot of technology at that company to like view share or anything with anything at all. And then, then I got laid off because the recession hit. That was fun. <laughs> so. Um, Everybody had no work at all. Uh, and I was in San Francisco. I was born and raised there. So we got hit pretty hard uh, by the recession in some areas. So there were no jobs at all. Uh, and I spent 10 months unemployed, basically spending all day trying to find any job, not even Starbucks. There was nothing to get. And finally, a, a friend of a friend uh, was working at a tiny startup, a payroll startup. And they desperately needed a part-time uh, help desk supports person. And I went, OK, sure, I need a job, any job, I'll do it. So I interviewed with them. I had no certs, no experience, nothing at all, really. And um, they decided to give me a chance. The IT director there and the COO, uh, Michael Bach and Cheryl Patterson, were like, hey, let's give you a try. Two months. If you suck, we'll fire you. I'm like, great, let's do it. And they offered me a full-time position in, within a month. So, uh, But Michael and Cheryl. They gave me a chance, but they really took an interest in like helping me catch up with everybody on the team. Like they suggested what certifications I could get, uh, getting into networking and A plus and all the basic basic things, so I could just kind of catch up with the terminology of what was going on. And I really just never looked back. I just started doing 
everything. And it found, I found this obsessive like love that I have now for different systems and tools. So I, I realized, and I tried to code, and while I could, it wasn't entertaining, but my obsession is total lifecycle management from the minute somebody starts at the company to the minute they leave. So that really kind of like made my whole career go, and I ended up getting to work at a lot of different places and security in different areas at Okta, Blend, and now at Keep Trucking. Uh, but it has probably been the most fun <laughs> I've ever had in my life, and I didn't expect it at all. Um, but now I basically spend uh, my time helping my team and uh, working with interns, usually high school kids, um, giving them a chance to play with things because I like giving people chances now. So that's, uh, that's how I got here. Uh, good morning. Yep. <laughs> good morning. Uh, my name is Dana Donaldson. I currently work as an IT systems engineer at Box in uh, Redwood City, California. I didn't really have much technology growing up. I think our first, um, the first computer I had in the house was a, a really dinky e-machine. Uh, when I moved, or when I got into high school, because I had to start typing papers, and uh, my mom forced me to type on a typewriter for a very long time, and I was having none of it. And um, and I actually had started um, playing with, I guess, uh, computer hardware in in high school. I had an after school program that um, just kind of was a bunch of guys ripping apart computers. And uh, I told my mom, like, okay, well, if you get me a computer, if it breaks, I'll fix it. And that was probably not true at the time. I probably couldn't have done it. Um, but uh, it somehow convinced my mother to get this um, kind of uh, ridiculous little machine. Um, but I, I, I wasn't really into much of the software stuff, really. I was, I was really more into hardware for a very, very long time. I did not go to school uh, for computer science. I went to the University of Miami, and I double majored in film and art history. I, <laughs> awesome. um, I, I did have to take a computer science class, and it was literally the worst grade I got in college. Um, so I mean, I, I, I think similarly to uh, some of these other stories, I needed a job in a junior and senior year. I was already working part time at the uh, on-campus art museum. But I needed a little bit more cash because it's the University of Miami, and Lord knows um, all that money I've been throwing at that school, I, I needed to make some back. Um, <laughs> I uh, started working with the, it was kind of like a networking team. They called it Kane Net Connections, but it was really, uh, it was really like a help desk. And I just kind of, people would come in, they didn't know how to put footnotes on their paper or something like that, and I just kind of tinkered until I could figure it out, and, and I was good at it. Uh, so I, I did that, and I didn't really think much of it other than, hey, I'm good at this, it's making some extra cash, uh, and here we are. Um, then the re recession hit. Uh, I graduated right when that hit, and there was nothing, literally nothing to do. And I lived in Florida, so there was double nothing to do. <laughs> I was a beach bum for a while and decided, well, this isn't going to work because I still uh, need to deal with uh, paying back all the things. Mm -hmm. And um, so I Googled uh, the best place to find a job, any job, and it said Washington, DC. Uh, there's a bubble there, apparently. So I uh, took 300 bucks, packed up, and couch surfed for a couple weeks, and I figured to myself, if I cannot find a job in a couple weeks, then I will go home and cry. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily enough, I interviewed and interviewed. I got a job in just the retail space, actually just clothing retail. And it was part time. Didn't want to do that. So I kept looking. And I ended up landing a role as a technician for Apple retail. So uh, the only reason I think I got that role was because I, I worked at KNet Connections at University of Miami, and I had a little bit of a, a knack for fixing things, random problems that would come uh, to the Genius Bar. And I also really liked hardware, and I could actually do that pretty well, um, just self-taught, but I could do it. 
And um, so I, I worked with Apple Retail and kind of hopped around the country a bit, went back home to Florida for a while. Um, then I uh, decided that, oh, well, if I want to do this Apple Retail thing, then I've, I've got to do it the best I can. So I need to go work in the flagship store. <laughs> so once again, packed up all my stuff and moved to San Francisco. <laughs> Um, and foolishly thought that uh, retail salary would allow me to live. <laughs> well, uh, well I, I saw the number when they offered me the role, and I was like, yeah, and I uh, realized that was not nearly enough to actually live there. Um, so I did, I did work um, for Apple Retail for a pro about five years, just under that, and um, it worked in the San Francisco Bay Area in Apple Retail as a genius, um, and then a, uh, a, uh, a trainer uh, for a bit. Um, and I decided I got to find something else, pays a little more, maybe I can get my, my foot in the door in one of these tech companies, there's so many. Uh, jobs were starting to open up again. And I just started interviewing for help desk roles uh, at some of these tech companies. Uh, Box had kind of a newer help desk at the time. Uh, they were they were smaller, uh, and I and I was like, I can do this. I I do this at the Genius Bar. Uh, so they hired hired me, and I've been working for Box since then. Uh, however, I was on the help desk for probably like a year and a half. I found Jamf was really interesting to me. I liked the idea of, uh, I thought of it almost like, hey, uh, all these people come to the desk, but if we could just make it so that they could push a button instead of have to talk to somebody, or if we could make it uh, so that they could maybe read an article or something, something so that they could do it themselves, because we had so few people on our help desk at the time. Um, it would just be easier, and people wouldn't get so frustrated. Maybe there's this, uh, this word I had learned, automation. Maybe we could automate something, mm -hmm. make it automatic. Um, and uh, so I kind of dug into that a bit. I uh, moved on to the systems engineering team, uh, and I uh, I was under somebody who was running the Jamf instance already. He decided after like three months to just pick up and go. So I was, uh, everything was pushed onto my lap. And they're like, here you go. Um, and I, I kind of just, I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm going to run with this. I don't really know what else to do. And um, so I was kind of the only uh, Mac, I guess, systems administrator slash, you know, Mac person uh, above help desk for, for a while. Recently, we were able to hire some new people, but um, I've been doing that. I, I think it's pretty cool. I like, uh, in my own time, kind of playing around and tinkering with automation and, and bringing that back to box and uh, hopefully making people's lives easier. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to do a lot of it silently. Sometimes I have to nag, but um, that is what I do now. Uh, I still do that. <laughs> and I actually really like it. <laughs> it's not art, and it's not film, but um, I like it. I dig it. <laughs> All right. OK, so I'm going to ask you guys a few questions. Um, first of all, um, I, um, I guess I'm going to start with Teresa, okay. and I'm going to ask, you know, what's really been encouraging you to stay in IT and technology? What are the things that make a big difference? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think as we seem to all share, uh, we kind of found this field and this career by accident. But I think what has encouraged me the most to stay is seeing the impact I have um, in the work that I do. Um, when I first started in, you know, Winsys, and then I kind of progressed into more help desk, desktop support. I could see that you know, me being able to help someone with their computer was a small impact, but a very valuable one. Oftentimes when people come to us, you know, they're having the worst day of their life. You know, they're like, my computer can't work. I lost all my stuff. And I can oftentimes help with that. Um, and as my skills grew and as my career progressed, I was able to kind of expand that scope. 
right? Something that I did well before could only help one person. Now the work that I do can enable hundreds of people and thousands of people. Uh, my current company has you know, over 4,000 active users that we're supporting and every day the work that I do can impact, if not all of them, a large portion of them. Um, and I think that is kind of my passion now, is enabling so many people to work more effectively with technology. And I think it's been kind of such a great ride because I have also found such a great community with my own teams and then also with Mac admins, just seeing the support that we all give each other, right? We all enter companies and we all deal with a lot of the same issues. I think Lauren and I were just chatting about this <laughs> earlier where, you know, we're, we are like, oh, I'm dealing with this other team and we're kind of working through this problem. It's like, oh, I have that same problem. And I think that has been very valuable for me in learning and developing myself, but then also kind of we're all pushing each other to be better. Thank you so much. Um, Aaron, uh, what are the things that um, you think are barriers for? Um, in the IT profession. <laughs> <laughs> Just diving right into the hard questions, all right. Um, well, shit. <laughs> um, let's see. What are some of the barriers? I don't know, technology, like... Sorry, y'all. No, go for it. This is great. Pause for effect. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't want to like just go straight out there and say something equivalent to women are not young, like young women, girls and women are not generally encouraged to spend a lot of time in the math and sciences. But as a person who hates math with a passion, oh. um, hey, oh, um, <laughs> it, it really does remove you from understanding what opportunities are available to you outside of the scope of CS. Um, and I think immediately made me shy away and uh, shy away from a lot of the hard sciences. Um, but I, I also think that there's something that's universally appealing about being a master of technology. Um, I was thinking a lot about why I do what I do um, or why I continue to do what I do, even though some days I feel like I'm beating my head against a wall. Um, and one of the things is that I really hate it when people say that they're non-technical, like that they don't understand technology. And I hear that much more frequently or I hear women apologize a lot more for their lack of technical expertise. Um, and it pisses me the hell off. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, it, it, it's, a bit of a, it's, a bit, it's a bit challenging, like saying like, what are the barriers? Because it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation too, right? Like we've been in this perpetual cycle along, you know, where the expectation is that there's going to be male dominance in technology, the hard sciences and math, um, and that women are naturally going to gravitate towards like the liberal arts and sciences. Um, therefore, you don't necessarily think about entering that workforce, which creates a dearth of women and people of diversity in that workforce, and lo, we start the process all over again. Um, but we, I, I mean, it, this might be controversial, but I also think that at this point, we are our own biggest barrier. I think we're at a, a bit of a tipping point now where people are very aware that this is a problem and we're looking at ways to address it. So the fact that there are conversations happening around it means that now it's time for people like us, women in general, to remain um, active participants in it and then also encourage that next generation that is possible for them and it's possible for them in different ways. Um, so it, it's, it's gaining, building and gaining our own confidence at this point. Um, I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, and that has taken me a long ass time. <laughs> long time. <laughs> hey, thanks. Um, I attribute a lot of that to Pixar, actually. Like, as we were talking about our origin stories, I'll just say this. Um, working in an environment um, that is both supportive of women, but supportive of you as an individual makes a hell of a lot of difference. Um, there's something to be said for. Um, uh, what is it, not lacking homogeny, I don't want to say that, but like being, encouraging someone to be themselves. Um, that was like a huge like coming out of my shell opportunity that I had working with a bunch of people who mostly did not come out of techno technology backgrounds. In fact, I worked with like three chefs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember what some of them did, but that one particularly stuck with me is like, no, nah, I went to culinary school. 
Like, cool. Um, my manager at the time uh, went was a theater major, right? But so hearing all those non-traditional paths, I'm like, oh shit, I'm just as weird as you are. This is great. Like, made a hell of a lot of difference. So I don't know if anybody has anything else to add to the barriers of that. I actually have one. Oh, I've got, sorry, I've got the thing. <laughs> I'll just make it really annoying. Uh, you have your own mic. Yeah. You can keep holding that. Um, it also, I think it's not just it's not just women and other people in other minority groups who are having trouble getting into IT. It's everyone. It's the younger generation in general. Male, straight, not, whatever, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of fear. I think fear is a huge barrier. And I also think that ethics and the law are a huge barrier right now. Everyone is seeing right now, particularly in the information security standpoint area, data breaches, the public trust in their data and their safety is in shambles. Companies that we used to rely on in big tech, because you know I've been in Silicon Valley and through two dot com bubbles, and I've watched this obsessive trust with uh, technology. Everything's going to be better. We're going to we're going to save the world. We're going to change the world. We're going to do everything. And I'm not saying those are bad things to do, but now we've become huge. We're not this tiny little world we used to be anymore. It's 2019, not 2001, 2002, and the law can't keep up with the technology. The technology is moving too quickly. The law, and you're seeing people, c crimes being committed, live streamed on Facebook. You're seeing uh, the, the analytic scandal. You're seeing all these different things happening. And now the public doesn't trust technology. They look at it with suspicion and fear. And that's even more of a barrier. People don't want to be that person who can read everyone's machine at the company. When you, and it's, fu it's kind of funny sometimes. You'll go into a meeting and they go, you can see everything in my email? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm the administrator of Slack and <laughs> Gmail and Okta. Yeah, I can see everything you're doing. I'm really busy. I do not have time to look at what you're on your side, what you're looking up. And, and, and why are you worried? No, thank you, please. What, what are you doing that, that I should, should I be worried? Should I be checking your <laughs> machine? But that's just it. No one wants to be that person anymore because they see these things happening in the news and they see the law not fail internationally. Not, and I'm not blaming any one country here. We as a society and humanity haven't, We've moved so quickly, we didn't look at the ramifications of what we've built. And as a result, we've made our own barriers. We're stopping minorities and women from getting in because we've made this. But we're also stopping ourselves because we haven't figured out how to handle what we've built as a world how and how to, how to proceed. We don't know what to do next. And a lot of people right now, even though we're kind of in a, in a boom, they feel another recession happening. People are scared. They know tech can't sustain itself at, as it is now forever. And they don't know if they want to invest their education into learning, into going to IIT to support something they don't know is still going to maybe. It's not that IT is not going to be a thing. IT will always be a thing. But they don't know if they want to be part of it. And they don't know if it's a good place to be. They don't want to be the next person on the news who caused a huge breach or failed or caused damage. So I feel like we're not educating the next generation of IT people to be excited about technology. I love technology and all the cool things that it does, but we're not having that thing of, who are we making this for? These are real people. And they might not want what we're making. So that's a problem, though. And I feel like everyone's focused on women and all these other groups, too. But like it's everybody. So I worry about that a lot. That is a great point, Lauren. Thank you. Um, Shauna, what do you think about you know, kind of adding on to that around um, barriers? But maybe also, uh, do you see glimmers of hope anywhere, too? Um, yeah, I feel like. Um, I, I want to kind of reiterate what you said, Erin, like mm -hmm. the, the barriers that we have for women in tech specifically. Um, I think that we need more spaces for people um, to come together. I think in the Mac admin Slack, there's a private channel for women and there's a lot of support there. Um, and I think I find a lot of, that's a good source of support for me. Um, but I think also um, there needs to be a way that we can come out, bring what's in there and kind of give that to the rest of the world. Because it exists in like this, such a small space, um, a lot of the things that we deal with, we have trouble bringing it to the attention of everybody else because like we are one way and then everybody else is another way. It's really hard for us to advocate on behalf of ourselves when we feel like it's you know it's something that's an uncomfortable conversation. Um, so I think that um, that's that's something that we need to work on. Also, it's you know a big barrier is self confidence because we don't look like everybody else in the tech space. Um, we we kind of struggle sometimes with like you know can I say this can I do this you know who do I finding an ally um, to 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 go to and also to like you know validate what you're saying or what you're bringing to the table um, is really is 
can be challenging, not in every circle, but can be challenging. Um, but I, I think that now we're getting to a point where we're having these conversations more often. Um, DNI is huge. It's, it's becoming kind of the, a, a, a big thing in tech. Um, and I think that we're getting to a point where we're getting closer to having these conversations. Um, and I think that that's really positive. So great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, would you like to add on to that too? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, not necessarily specifically women uh, in tech, but uh, diversity and inclusion, as you were saying. Um, I see a lot of hope in um, a lot of programs that I, I, I see them in the Bay Area. I'm, I'm assuming there are some globally. I'm assuming there are some elsewhere. So assuming, sorry. But um, things like Genesis Works and Year Up mm -hmm. and things like that, um, I, I've gone and, and talked to some of these students um, and uh, they're, I see a lot of excitement and I see a lot of interest in IT and tech in general and even uh, a coding and, and things like that. And um, getting to work with them and just answer their questions and link on LinkedIn and see how they're doing and just help perpetuate that. Uh, I do see hope there. And it's great that those kind of programs exist, especially because some people can't go to school for this stuff. And then I stand there and I go, I didn't go to school for this stuff. Uh, I know a lot of people that maybe didn't go to college at all and they are in the tech industry. It's not something that's necessary, and you can be a part of this, and you can grow in this, and you don't necessarily have to stop in IT, but it's a great uh, stepping stone uh, to, to look at a whole bunch of different tech uh, careers. Uh, so I see a lot of hope in that as well. That's good. Do you, um, uh, I'll, I'll throw this out to everybody. Can, uh, do you feel like education, the education system is really serving Kids anymore? No. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> not not that even close. Question. That was a fantastic question. That was a good so, one. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I, you know, I think you know, you think about all the, the ways you ended up, you know, getting into your careers here, and um, what do you what do you think needs to change? Uh, excitement, uh, and, and 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 also letting people try things. Mm -hmm. There's this structured way of education that we have here, and you get, I've watched this happen, it happened to me. You might, you know, your, your kid, you get to do all those little classes in you know, elementary school or younger, and you might have found something you liked. It could have been drawing, could have been art, could have been music, could have been computers, coding, technology, draw, uh, video games, design, anything. And then you get kind of blithely just kind of shifted away from something you were interested in because you won't make money in it mm -hmm. or you won't get a degree in it or you can't get an MBA or you're never going to be successful if you do that. Like, they're not saying those in those words, but they're making kids feel that way by saying, oh, don't f focus on music. You'll never be a musician. Um, you should take math instead. And I'm not saying that's a bad choice necessarily, but you can be good at math and music. You can be good at all of those things and no one should be able to like tell you how you feel about like that you should not be interested. You're not actually really interested in that. Wait, why not? I'm really interested in that, by the way. But there aren't any classes. There's no place to go. And they're focusing. And there's still a huge thing in the world of you need a college degree to do something. And that is not true. It shows me that you've completed something. And maybe depending on your major, it might be very applicable to your role, like a doctor. I would really hope you went to medical school if you were going to operate on me, please. <laughs> that would be important. Or if you're representing me in court, I would hope that you did really good in law school. That, that's a thing. But you don't need that in tech. And I think that was a hallmark of tech, that you could, anybody could come and be. Anybody who could look at something and figure out tech could come. But the, that's not going in the education system. Right. We find out after. So a lot of people, I feel like, are drowning in college or after school is over, not knowing where to go or knowing that this is even an opportunity. Like, all of you have so much information. Like, I'm sure there's tons of students, and I work with a lot of them, who'd love and kill to talk to you because they never knew they could do it. Mm -hmm. and, that, and the education system doesn't provide like, interviews with people like us for them to look at. And that's really sad. Yeah. And I think in regards to traditional education, I circling back to Europe, mm -hmm. which Dana mentioned, right. um, yeah, I um, currently work with a number of Europe interns. And if you haven't heard of Europe, they're kind oh. of uh, an organization that takes students of all walks of life. A lot of them haven't got high school diplomas. Um, and they spend six months uh, training them in class 
in a variety of fields, but kind of for us specifically in IT. And then they spend six months having an internship and working in IT uh, at different companies. And I know a number of large companies and small companies alike in the Bay Area use Europe. And I think the interns that I've worked with have been spectacular. And they're just so eager to mm -hmm. learn. And this is such a valuable opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. um, because I think for me, I found this chicken and egg problem when I first started IT was you kind of, the only way to get experience is to do it, right? I don't think anything that I use day to day I ever learned in a classroom, and it was never offered to me as a traditional you know, major to go into IT, and especially with the changing landscape. But it's so valuable for them to have six months of working experience, seeing what it's actually like, and learning you know, day to day skills, working at a help desk, managing computers, um, you know, building hardware, things like that that they wouldn't have access to. Um, before and I think that's the kind of education that I'm very excited to see pop up and, yes. as opportunities for people. Um, you know, it's it's we've hired full-time employees from our Europe interns Amazing. and they've been great additions Amazing. to our team. Yeah. And yeah. Genesis Works does it yeah. even younger when they're in high school. Yeah. I've had them previously. They are fantastic interns and they're getting credit for school. They leave school early to come and work for you. You pay them. And then they get credit for school. I write them recommendations and jobs. And my first batch is about to graduate from college. And I hope I have a job rec open, because they are pre-trained, ready to go. And I think they're wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's the addition of the myth of a linear pathway, too, right? Like, that's basically yeah, what it is. It's yeah. like, you're going to do this thing. You're going to do this thing really well. And you're going to do it forever. <laughs> like, cool. <laughs> That's Sounds so great. not how it goes, right? <laughs> so especially when we're talking about like barriers to entry, I think that is a huge one. Actually, Teresa and I had the opportunity to speak to high school students exactly about this and like the wide-eyed terror that they look at you with when you tell them like, I'm not doing what I wanted to do 10 years ago. <laughs> like, what does that mean? My life. <laughs> like it is like it's something that is definitely not emphasized enough, even if you do desire to go and get a four-year, a two-year, a four-year or any kind of degree, right? Like that should be an option for people, but the idea that is the only pathway that's going to bring you success and longevity in your career is complete bull honky. Mm -hmm. So, yep. um, and so. since we're plugging our favorite programs too, <laughs> um, I work with a, a program called Built by Girls that's mm -hmm. through the Oath uh, group. They are freaking phenomenal. And the other reason that I like them talking about like moments of, or like glimmers of hope is that they are looking for non-gendered uh, advisors, they call them, um, to introduce girls and young women into tech as a larger sphere to show that there are a multiplicity of roles that you can do within technology that may be technically based but may also be ancillary to like the meat of engineering. So you don't necessarily need a CS degree. You don't need the hard coding skills that were once expected of everyone who is going to be um, joining like the web 2.0 boom, right? Because we're basing a whole bunch of our ideas around what the industry is now based on these like archaic principles of, um, of I don't know, like the, I don't know, the barrier to entry of technology, which does, it just doesn't exist. I mean, codeless apps are a thing. And there is Google. You can. And Google. There's nothing yeah. to stop people from. <laughs> the Googs. From, IT right? person, like, subtitle, master Googler. Yeah. Um, but no, it just, it, that's that thing. You really need, like, the knowledge to learn all these things that we all do is at the tip of the fingers of anybody right now. You can. They just don't know where to go. And yeah. get, it's just too much. You can go into cybersecurity. IT has so many different fields within it. Like, they're looking at you like, I don't know which one to do. And I'm like, well, which one do you like? <laughs> I'm like, well, why don't you try a couple of them and tell me which one you like the most? And then yeah. I like Jamf. Awesome. You are now in charge of Jamf. Congratulations. You're my new Jamf admin. Uh, one of the other guys over there will answer any questions you have. Uh, I'd start Googling. Uh, I recommend Jamf Nation. <laughs> and they just look at you. And I'm like, just, just try it. Just play with it. That's great. So I'm going to ask um, Dana, um, what does diversity look like to you? Oh, oh, oh. Deep. Deep. are coming out. Deep. Sean is coming your way, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what does diversity look like to me? Um, I, uh, man. Box has a, like a, a it's one of our, um, why do I always lose language when I need it? <laughs> um, it's, it's one of our uh, like um, values. values. Yeah, thank you. 
is one of our values, and it's bring your blank self to work. That's what diversity means to me. It, it, it doesn't define anybody. It is literally a blank that you get to fill. Um, and it's, I, I think that, um, to me, diversity just, it, it's, oh man, it, it's just allowing, like you said, to come to work and just be who you are and not having to worry about someone else defining you. You just get to be who you are, bring it, and if you bring your blank self to work, you're going to do your best work because you get to be who you are, you get to feel comfortable, and, um, and that's what gets your creative juices flowing. That's what uh, helps you uh, feel comfortable in, in where you are and what you're doing. Um, I, I don't think that, I mean, it's, it's hard to put a, a definition on this because it shouldn't be. There shouldn't be a definition. It's just, you just bring yourself to work, whatever that is. Um, Shauna, I know that you have a lot, a lot to say on that for sure. Um, well, I think that we, as, as a world, tend to think of diversity as a destination or as a place that we can get if we do certain things. Um, I think that there is a lot of opportunity to look at diversity not as like a thing or as something that's outside of ourselves, but something that's inside of ourselves, right? It, yeah. Like it's not defined. Some of us actually carry that, like the, the diverse people in the room have to carry the burden of what diversity is. Um, it doesn't always exist with everyone, um, but I think that when we start thinking, thinking of it more of um, as you know, an opportunity to connect with people who might not have the similar background or the same, you know, things, then we're able to like create a, a better environment, a better product. When you have more diverse voices, you have more to add. Um, and I think that, um, I, I can't really say what diversity is, but I can say um, how, it, how it affects people. Um, it's hard to define, it's, it's not something that's super tangible, but, um, but that's how I would start. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, on that note, I think for me, one of the moments when I'm like, hmm, this is it, is diversity is to me, it looks like that moment when I'm standing with a couple of my teammates at someone's desk and we're chatting about how we should solve this problem that we were just given, right? And we're disagreeing, you know, but it's like, you know, it's mm -hmm. it, where we're talking it through, we're kind of going through, oh, I've seen this before and I think it might go this way, and everyone has their different opinions and together, we form potentially the best solution any of us could have ever come up with. And I think that is so valuable to me, is those moments where it's like 20 minutes at someone's desk. And we started off with, oh my god, how are we going to solve this? And at the end, we're like, huh, that might just, that, that might just work. And for me, that, that's it. Well, right. that's, that based on ability versus anything else. People would get that. It's all about whether you can do it, not who you are, where you came from. In this moment, we're figuring this out, yep. and that's it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. We're so also, I'm going to ask. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm going to ask. Did you want to? We're also getting to a place where if you prioritize diversity, more people, more diverse candidates will want to work with you. Um, that's that's really important. I think um, there's a statistic I read somewhere. I think it was Harvard Business Review that said um, um, companies who embrace diversity are 70 percent more likely to capture new markets. That's how important it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that. There hasn't been enough conversation around it um, to, to help people understand how they can leverage it and that kind of thing. Um, I think that um, we could be better about using the resources that are out there. Um, there are like online programs you can take about diversity. The same way that like we all work and we figure things out, we create solutions to our problems, there are also resources out there to help us be more diverse and be more equitable. So I think that we could start thinking of diversity in a way that, um, that can create a, a healthier environment um, and a better place to work. So. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna ask one last question, okay? And that is, and it's for everybody, and it is, um, think of the most radical future or change that you'd like to see. Mm. What would it be? Yes, Aaron. I'm just gonna throw some shade here, but how about a female president? <laughs> <laughs> We'll start small. That's not the only one that I have. <laughs> Anywhere, female prime minister. I don't know. You're right. Like, come on. 
Has there ever been a female? I'm yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, wow. I, so long ago, though, no one remembers them. Tim Campbell. Tim Campbell, that's it. Okay. That's good, though. I mean, I just came from the UK, and they've, lived, you know, there's only been two in the history of the UK, which is also just freaking ridiculous. And both of them have been through, like, the most trying parts yeah. of, or most some of the times. most trying parts of like modern <laughs> British history. And it's fascinating to me the way that this is going to be like written down in the annals of their, like, um, in the annals of British history, <laughs> to be repetitive. <laughs> Say. Uh, it's like that Jason Bourne film where they <laughs> try to get what's her name, <laughs> Pamela Landy. Yeah. I mean, uh, so um, what what other thoughts do people have about radical? Did you want to? What would be radical? Change? Go for it. I just wanted to say a female president is actually a tame request. That's not <laughs> radical at all, <laughs> and it, it needs to happen. <laughs> so, for real. So I'll throw that out there. I don't have a good answer yet, but. Um, in all honesty, I would like to see real accountability, real, real accountability from corporate America, and that includes big tech, all of it. And I don't mean, I want accountability for what we've done, good and bad, but I also want accountability for how they treat their staff. I think that would be the biggest impact because, you know, all these companies are going in saying, hey, we're, we're doing all these things, these diversity panels, and yet constantly on the news, there's always, like, their treat, how they treat their cons consultants or, or, or there's protests or there's, it comes out that they aren't really holding anybody accountable. People have to sign documents so they can't actually take legal action over things that have been done to them. And I don't mean, I'm not talking about just, like, sexual harassment or any of that or the Me Too movement. I'm talking about everything. Like, when companies are big enough that they affect entire, the entire world, because they do now, there needs to be accountability. Because right now, the government, because the law can't keep up, they can't hold them accountable. So nobody is. And that is, it, 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 it's so far reaching. That would be my radical thing. Because that is going to be very hard. Because governments and people have been trying to get businesses to be, res be accountable for their actions for centuries. So this is going to be, and this is, we're in totally new world here um, when it comes to the tech. I want to see them do that. And it's going to take time. But I think that that would be amazing. Yes. Oh, great, great. Any other one you want to add to it? I would like to see, not just in the tech space, but in every industry, um, especially the one, more so the ones that are kind of homogenous, um, embrace diversity as an actual, um, as an actual initiative. Um, I would like to see that happen. I would like to see, um, you know, more voices um, being heard. Like, the more homogenous um, industries like tech or like law um, are are the ones that I think should embrace it a little bit more. But I'd like to see there be some like standards um, around that um, and getting more voices out um, and active and, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily radical change, but I'd love to, at some point in my career, hopefully soon, be able to walk into every meeting that day and not be the only one. Oh my God. <laughs> and I think that's something that I'm so used to now, so it doesn't really shock me anymore. Um, but I'm like, you know, I walk into meetings and I'm the only one in any leadership position, or I'm just the only female there. Um, and I think it's, it's one of those moments where, you know, you walk in, you're the only one, and, you know, we're humans. We, we need social connection and we need validation, and if I'm the only one and I don't know anyone else there, it's oftentimes, you know, one of those me against them or, you know, I feel like I can't be heard. Uh, and it's really about finding those allies, but if I'm not the only one, it's not as big of a situation for me as, you know, in addition to whatever the meeting is about, I'm thinking about all of these other things, about making sure my voice is heard, my ideas are, you know, credited to me, uh, and things like that. Thank you. Uh, I don't, once again, I don't know if this is radical change either, and I've actually seen it slowly start to change. I think that's lucky. Um, but uh, just kind of circling back on our, uh, I guess, question and, and conversation about just education, in general, um, I think that we just need to kind of redefine that, especially in the United States. I mean, I can't really speak to other countries. Uh, everybody's got their own issues, I think, with education, perhaps. But um, 
just uh, seeing uh, the expectations change because there's so many brilliant minds out there um, that maybe just don't ever get a chance because they don't have the money or they don't have, uh, they're, not, they're not able to go to school because they're helping their family in, in a, uh, on a farm or something along those lines. Um, and I think that the, the definition of education should kind of just change, or the definition of what you need to get into a field that you enjoy, not necessarily only tech, uh, just needs to change. Because um, I think we could do a lot of really cool things with some of the amazing ideas out there. People just figuring out how to do things just because they have to. Uh, and uh, that could make a big difference, I think. Yeah. That's I was gonna like if I'm not only throwing social shade at our political system, um, I will will speak to the community a little bit. Is I think this is a maybe not a I don't think this is a radical idea to us in this room, but I think there is something to be said for its radical nature. Outside of that, is that um, IT infrastructure, workplace technology, whatever the nomenclature is around your like um, your technological resource unit, if you will. Um, are actually a leader, right, in, within the company themselves, that we end up having a seat at the table from uh, on with regards to business decisions from day one. Um, I, I think we see ourselves as an ultimate and a consistent partner in that, but the idea that we would actually be the ones who foster, um, grow, and then implement those kinds of changes at that kind of like global level within a company is still pretty unheard of, uh, mostly from the top down. Um, so I would love to see that sooner rather than later. I think it's a really cool and a really interesting bend in terms of the way that we talk about like our morality and ethics as well. Um, and that is the global tie-in to it is that I would like to really see larger conversations within organizations, especially within technology, um, that are ethically and human focused and human forward. Um, because we, like this was said earlier, like we make this stuff for people. And if we are going to make the best things that we want to for people, then we have to be thinking about people and about different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. So, fingers yeah. crossed, here we are, doing our best. Okay, well you all did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. And <laughs> Yeah, we have Q and A. Oh, yeah, Q and A. Awesome. Oh, damn. Any, yeah. Anybody have any questions yeah. or comments? <laughs> no. Have we terrified you? Come on. Yeah, right. I invited. Yes. 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 Here, I was gonna say. We can just. Can, yeah, we can also like, repeat the question, but job, if this will work. To you. <laughs> yeah. We need one of those little throwing like, mics. Come on. Just like throw it at people. Oh, the the box. I love those. Yeah. Thanks for that panel. It was really great to hear your opinions. Um, one thing I'd just like to make as a comment first is uh, I think that the uh, diversity conversation and the narrative has been picked up and it's now sometimes used uh, inappropriately. Is there something to be said for targeting uniformity and just saying, well, we don't like seeing uniformity and just trying to break that down instead? When you were talking about being the only female in, in your meeting, uh, it should be highlighted that that's uniformity at its worst. There are three or four other people in that room who have uh, that similar, you know, they may be similar. Should we target that instead? And so we shame, use shame a little bit in that uniformity. That's an interesting perspective. I, I guess we'll, I'm, 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 I'm sure thinking about it. Oh, thanks. There's a really great podcast about this. I don't know if anybody's a Reply All fan. I will find it and I will, yeah. <laughs> um, I've been binging like a whole bunch of the old, uh, the vintage seasons. And they, this is one of the things that they cover really, um, really early on is job, the, yeah. oh my God, it's so good. Um, I think calling out the uniformity is really important. And it's totally uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me. Also, why am I the one who has to call out the uniformity, right? Like, so you're, you're working with the burden of having to represent yourself, the burden of then feeling like you're the one who is now in charge of the representation going forward. And then you're also not necessarily making any friends, really, right? Like calling out that you are different from them and that you should be recognized kind of blows. Um, 
Anybody want to help me out with the rest of that statement? <laughs> no? Well, Too much of a hot potato? I think, I think that I, I don't, it's not so much on the, univer, on the uniformity side, but um, there's a quote that I think of when I think of DNI. You know, diversity is being you know invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. that's a big one. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So when we're talking about um, diversity, it's important to to understand that like diversity is very different from inclusion. Oh, no, and I'm not really sure about the unif uniformity part. I like haven't thought about that. But Ooh. Okay. yes, Ooh. did we? Uh... Maybe. It so it's really humbling to, to listen to you guys and not really know what a good path forward is to help people. Uh -huh. I, I feel like I have a bunch of ideas and then I'm terrified that they're all really offensive in some way. <laughs> so I that's mean, part I of think, the problem. Save yeah. them. Save them. You should also <laughs> talk to us. Yeah, so <laughs> that, we should all talk. <laughs> and that's what I want to know. Like, I, I think one of the most powerful things is if you guys could, if you can, like off the top of your head, share an experience where you felt like somebody actually made a difference or you know left an impression on you and did something to improve that, maybe we could take that away with us. Yeah. Uh, I, could, I can help with that. So um, I was at a job that was a burnout job. We'll go from that. Uh, and I was completely exhausted. And um, I'd had maybe multiple managers like every six months to a year. I kept getting a new manager. It was kind of a nightmare. Um, and I felt very threatened in the environment that I was in. It was not a safe environment, not just to be a woman, to be anybody, frankly. Um, and that was really, really tough to just keep existing because you, you need a job. And a new manager came in, and they were from a much bigger company like PwC, and he sat down with me and my team, each of us individually and as a team, and just said, are you okay? And most of us didn't say anything for like the first day because we're like, what, what is this? <laughs> what? This is a trap. <laughs> And that was like my first thought. This is a trap and I'm going to get fired for whatever reason. And after, he, he kept asking. He would not let us get away with not saying something. It was very casual. It wasn't forceive. It just didn't one-on-one -on -one or even casual. Hey, you okay? How things going? Can I help with anything? And then we all started talking. We all started talking. It came out. Some of us cried. Some of us had nervous breakdowns. Like, that's how bad this was. And he listened. He listened the entire time and then said, I want you guys to feel safe telling me these things. He wrote down the things that needed to be dealt with. He took care of the things that had to be fixed. And then suddenly, we felt protected. We felt safe enough that we could tell him that something was wrong. And he let us get all the baggage out of stuff that wasn't his responsibility. He was cleaning up the mess of past bosses. And that's, but he was a good manager, and he listened. And that was great, because every single person on my team, male, female, not, they, we were all ragged and scared, and he just wanted someone to tell us it was going to be OK and give us the time to be ready to answer, because it took us a week or two to trust him enough to even answer that question. So it was like a calm, friendly consistency. Are you OK is such a simple question. And sometimes the answer is, yeah, I'm fine. I mean, it's just the usual. And sometimes there's, no, I'm not. Now that I think about it, I'm not. And I don't know what to do. And it's totally OK. That's actually the biggest fear that you have is like, there are tons of people I've talked to all over the community who want to help and don't know how or maybe even scared to bring things up. And then there's the weird worry on our end even, like we have all these problems we just brought to light. And none of us know how to move forward. So it's OK as long as we all just keep talking and keep listening. asking and listening and try. We're going to fail. We're going to mess up. We're going to come up with bad ideas. <laughs> but you don't come up with any good ones if you didn't have some bad ones. So. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're even thinking about it, that you have ideas, that's great. So just keep asking. And I think to tag off of that, in addition to listening, one thing that I would say is share information. Uh, when I first started in my career, and I was really unsure of my own ability and just my, my career in general, I had no idea where I wanted to go. and. I had no sense of direction. And oftentimes, I felt that I was too timid and shy to bring it up with my direct manager or my peers, any of my career goals, because I was like, oh, it's shooting too high. And stating that out there is very difficult. And I found that if you're a manager with direct reports, or if you, you know, just even have peers to talk about and share different ways that people can grow in their careers. And like, don't assume that because someone doesn't ask that they don't necessarily want that information, right? I think I've gotten some valuable information from peers and managers about, hey, you know, I'm not sure what you're looking for in your career, but these are some different paths that are available, and this is how you can learn, and these are different certs that you can take, and 
having that information shared with me when I didn't necessarily go out to, to ask for it because I was too scared to was really valuable. We'll talk about some like day-to-day -day things that you can do too. Some we things because we're talking about like a huge macro problem. It's like, well, fuck. What am I gonna do? Right? <laughs> sorry. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. So sorry. <laughs> cool. All right. I think right. <laughs> the ship has sailed. It's a little late now. It's already in there. But like, it's just like you literally. Like, I mean, I feel the same way you do, right? Like, I sit down every day and I'm like, fuck. What are we gonna do about this? Um. So first off, talk about your failures. That is so empowering. That was one of the things that made me really comfortable with getting up here and being like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing every day, right? Like, is talk about your failures because of that lack of confidence that does exist, right? Like, we know there's this big nebulous thing that is just differentiating between um, those who have been doing this for a long time and those who are trying to enter this field. Um, knowing that somebody else doesn't know the answer, which was ingrained in me by the Apple store, <laughs> um, and then being able to be like, I don't know, and hearing somebody else who was even my superior saying that was so powerful for me, because it made me comfortable and able to do that too. It meant that my failures were not going to be held against me. Mm -hmm. um, other little things that you can do. Um, Call that shit out in meetings when you notice you're like, not like, hey, token female. Um, but like, you know, being like, <laughs> right, don't do that. But being like, hey, like, has anybody thought about the fact that like, this is very mismatched and calling that out on behalf of somebody. Um, elevating other people's voices, right? Which again, big nebulous thing. But being like, that was a really great idea. Teresa, really great idea. Dana, I love what you had to say about that program that you're working on. Um, Doing those little things and calling out somebody else's successes means that everybody else hears it, right? Um, not jumping in on other people's voices. So either, I mean, like, I know places that have implemented talking sticks legitimately. That way that everybody has, I see a lot of heads nodding, so I think there's similar behaviors mm. that are being mimicked now. Um, but, right, like, you don't necessarily have to go that aggressively, but if somebody decides that they jump in because of their enthusiasm or because they're just, like, they feel very strongly about something, just make sure that you return to that other person mm -hmm. who doesn't have as loud of a voice as you because it might just be the difference between someone who's extremely extroverted or versus really introverted. That might be, like, the one thing that they just work themselves up to say and they just got trampled and that blows, right? So making sure that you give them a platform that they can participate fully and equally is awesome. Um, pauses, pauses for silence. This was a really awesome statistic that I just learned and I can never remember them, but people tend to respond to questions after like after three seconds of silence. So that awkward moment where you just sit there <laughs> and then somebody raises their hand is totally normal. So leaving an opportunity for that silence in that space, somebody can gather their thoughts and articulate them appropriately. Um, it makes a huge difference, especially in settings where the, like you're in a room like this or you are just uncomfortable or don't necessarily feel totally at place within your workspace yet, right? Like you may just not have the rapport with people to be able to jump in and talk that freely. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> Booyah. Um, we talk about this a lot, I will say too. We talk about this a lot in the diversity channel and the leadership channels in Mac admins. Mm -hmm. We have had conversations like this over and over again, so I highly recommend that you jump in there, read yeah. through the archives. Um, the other thing about that is we, I, I really highly reemphasize, ask questions. It is okay. They are going to sound weird and awkward and terrible and it's gonna make you really uncomfortable and it's totally fine, right? Because we are saying that it's a safe space. So knowing full well that you have a safe space to ask this of us, both here in this context, but also online in the forums, like just keep asking questions. Like not because we don't know your perspective either. Yeah, like, we exactly. Want, we want to know, but because none of us have talked about this before, and nobody wants to have an awkward conversation. That's a huge <laughs> thing. Um, it's just so hard, and we're all sitting there going, "Okay, tell me how to fix it." And I'm like, uh. I don't know. <laughs> Do you know? No. Okay. Uh, let's figure it out. Fill in the boat as we're sailing it. The gentleman yeah, over there had, he had a question. question. Yeah, he's been waiting for it. Right. Yeah. Somebody else? Can we go yeah. to the break? Oh, we're running out of time. Oh, we're out of time. Oh. I want to give you.